I was a city boy. I had my Hermes tie, I had my brogues, my pinstripe suit. And, you know, I enjoyed having a bit of money in my pocket and uh, pretending that I was really quite important. And um, quite, a, quite a little city gent. But because of the general business environment, there was a lot of stress. I was working long hours, not much time off, not really enjoying it that much, and I think ultimately that, that led to me becoming ill. I literally lied on my mum's sofa for a year, experiencing the most bleak clinical depression. The depression was brought on by having not enough thyroid in my system. I couldn't speak a whole sentence. I couldn't walk. It was certainly the lowest point of my life. When it was warmer in England, I felt better. Thyroid is used to create body heat, and when you're in a warm climate, your deficiency is much less obvious. So I thought, well, if I go to an even warmer climate, maybe I feel even better. I decided the two go travelling. Ended up going to Singapore, Malaysia, and then ended up in Thailand. And sure enough, uh, it was a big tonic as soon as I landed in a warmer, freer world. I felt an awful lot better and, you know, it proved to be a good move. I could really live like that for the rest of my life. The idyllic existence I was, well, I was staying in a wooden hut on the beach, frolicking around in the surf during the day and eating lots of lovely food and then starting drinking fairly early on and trying to get off with any number of gorgeous female tourists. It was a three-month existence of pure hedonism and fun. Sometimes going home alone, sometimes not. Uh, but living to um, frolic another day. He had all the elements of a sort of dreamlike existence for a young man who wants to just get stuck into a few adventures. And that's exactly what I ended up doing. Hong Kong was a cultural shock because just literally the amount of people in the buildings. I was used to space and beauty, and suddenly it's just this noise and bustle. How you going, mate? Spare bird? I'll take it. Hi, how you doing? Good, I'm Oz. There was this bloke in my hostel called Oz who arrived after I'd been there for about a week, and I just kind of took him under my wing. He seemed a bit naive in terms of drinking and going out and having fun, and I just showed him how to do it. Expert, but we went out drinking and he soon picked it up actually. He was a very good student. And we soon became very firm friends. We both had dwindling reserves of cash. I had frittered it away on booze pretty much. <laughs> I clearly needed to work if I was going to stay away from England, and I certainly wasn't ready to go home. Oh! There he is, Jeffy Boy. How you doing, fella? Marsha, do me a favor. Let me get a, a bottle Rhett of beer. Rhett moved into the hostel. Uh, right. He gave guided tours to German tourists because he spoke German but was American. Well, he was tiny. He was like a midget. You should have seen his wife, man. She looked like she was in the NBA, man. She was like 6'6", six, 6'7". Six, six, she was huge. He wasn't a particularly likable character from the start. He was quite a loud mouth. Bottoms up, buddy. Uh, literally loud. Ah! <laughs> Yes, that is and what I'm um, about. he's sort of boastful and whatever. Take that, and, keep the change, right? you know, not really my kind of guy, but slowly we got talking, and slowly it emerged that being a tour guide wasn't his only source of income. So, uh, you boys want to make some money? Really? If you want to make good money, boys, you got to get into gold. Gold. <laughs> what? What? Get into it. He revealed <laughs> that he had been okay, wait, taking gold some gold over to Nepal, and this sounded like extraordinary. What on earth are you doing? All you got to do is take the gold on a plane, spend the weekend in Kathmandu, take a look at the mountains, fly back Monday. Kathmandu. Yeah, good. Yeah. Nice. And that he was going to do it again, and that there were spaces for other people to go with him 
if I wanted. You know the guys at the airports, custom officials, that sort of thing? They're all in on it. Every single one of them. It just sounded frightening, scary, involving people I didn't know in countries I didn't know, and that it could go horribly wrong, and I, you know, I wasn't that in that desperate a situation. Listen, fellas, take it or leave it. Uh, leave it, thank you. What about you, Oz? Oh, mate, I'll think about it, and, uh, no. It's all good, boys. I'm not gonna twist your arms. He disappeared for a weekend, didn't tell us where he was going, and came back with a wadge of dollars, a big, fat, green wadge of dollars. You know, was, we were just transfixed. I think Oz and I just were sitting opposite him, and we just thought, well, you know, that's a lot of money. It was actually $2,000. Wasn't a great deal of money, but to people who were traveling uh, and running out of cash, it was a lifeline. It seemed so tempting. Just a weekend away, not that difficult. Money in your hand, dead easy. And we were pretty much doomed from then on. Oz and I approached Rhett and said, we're on for the next run. He was pleased, and he said, the next phase was we had to go with him one evening to Chunking Mansions, which was a notorious tower block where all sorts of nefarious activities went on. So one evening, Oz, Rhett and myself went downtown and met the fourth uh, member of the team. Guys, what? this is Eric, he's French, in case you haven't guessed. A guy called Eric, who was a maitre d' at a restaurant in Hong Kong. Right, we're nice guy, we got on well with him. Yeah. Let's go. Let's do it. Let's go. In many ways, it was uh, a bit odd, it was a bit like a joke, because, I mean, there, there was me, the Englishman, there was the American who was Rhett, there was Oz, the Australian, and there was this Frenchman who just turned up called Eric, and we were all going into this very dodgy-looking uh, tower block to meet up with two even dodgier... Nepalese gangsters. It was rather exciting because I'd heard about this place but never been there and it had a, quite a reputation for being a centre for prostitution and smuggling and, you know, you could hire a room by the hour and this was one of those places where dodgy deals could be done uh, and no questions would be asked. And we went up the lifts to some floor near the top to meet up with two Nepalese men who had been waiting for us. first thing that hit me was that one of them was wearing a, a shoulder holster and the end of his gun was, was sticking out from under his arm. And I must say, your stomach sort of sinks a bit. There was a, a gradual um, dawning realisation that suddenly we were involved in a very serious world and we were to be on best behaviour. They had one multi-pocketed denim waistcoat which had $400,000 worth of gold in it. And he wanted to see whether we were physically strong enough to pick up this vest and put it on. It weighed over four stone. Obviously, you go from being 11 stone to 15 stone suddenly. It was just very heavy, and you could feel your feet. 
you know, you were a bit like Robocop when you were walking with that on, because suddenly you were four stone heavier. We all wanted to prove ourselves to each other that we could handle it. But, you know, we were all physically strong enough. We all managed to do it, and we satisfied them that we would be good mules. My only question was... What happens if we get caught? No problem. Nothing, man. Sent home, deported, one night in prison, that's it. So it seemed there wasn't any real downside in this. One night in prison, I mean, we can all deal with that, can't we? Too bad, right? right. <laughs> we had a good drink that night because we were rushing, we were buzzing from the adrenaline of agreeing to do this. And, you know, being in the presence of some serious gangsters with guns. This is all good stuff, as far as we can tell. Yeah, every single week, $2,000 a week, boys. It's frightening as well. But without that fear, you don't have the excitement. So it's all part and parcel of this progressively crazy adventure. There was a week between trying on the jacket and doing the gold run. And during that week, there were times when I would ask myself what the hell I thought I was doing. I've still got time to pull out, and why don't I just be sensible? It came round to be a definite yes. Not so much because of the money, but more because the more I considered it, the more I believed it to be a huge adventure, and it became me wanting to prove that I could do something as dangerous and as stupid as that. I'd been ill and restricted for a long time. This became a, an expression of my being better and my freedom. This was proof that I was back. And not only was I back, I was back with balls. was to arrive at the airport, check in, go through to the departure lounge, and there somebody would meet us and hand the gold over to us in the toilets. There was a lot of um, nerves at this point. We, well, there was tension. We're sitting around waiting, thinking, you know, where is this guy? You know, the first group of people on our plane have got on a coach and have driven across the tarmac to the plane, and we're, still this guy isn't here. You know, it's like, what's happening? And you think, are we being watched? Do people keep an eye out for people who look nervous? Eventually, he turned up at the very last minute. Eric followed him into the toilet first, and then we all went in one by one after that. I was almost forcing myself to do something which was against my nature. I was, you know, just a, a middle-class kid backpacking around suddenly doing something totally illegal, which was probably the first major illegal thing I'd done in my life. The guy was standing outside a cubicle, and on, on, on the floor of the cubicle was the denim waistcoat containing the gold.
we had to wear jackets and shirts in order to provide two layers to conceal what we were carrying beneath. And he looked me up and down and said, yes, that looks good. I looked in the mirror and... And there was this kind of ashen-faced, rather sort of sweaty, wide-eyed individual staring back at me, saying, you really think this is a good idea? That was the dawning realisation that there was no turning back now, and it was going ahead. It was just an intense uh, fear, primarily. Fear of, of the unknown and uh, what one was letting oneself in for. We didn't want to stand out like a sore thumb, but there we were, the last people getting on, delaying everyone else, delaying even the takeoff of the plane, probably. Carrying four stone of gold is a lot easier when you're charged with adrenaline and you're therefore a lot stronger than you normally are. I have some vague recollection of Rhett saying that he felt that he was carrying even more than usual. And that was really the only indication that uh, Perhaps we were carrying right up to the maximum of, of what could possibly be taken by someone. It seems that the deal with gold smuggling was that you can fly it over to Nepal, where they have no metal detectors at the airport, and the customs people in Nepal were paid off to allow you to go through without any trouble. Then it's taken across land to India where they do have metal detectors at the airport and it's sold in India for a vastly inflated price. What you haven't done is, is, is paid the, the tax for bringing it into either Nepal or India. So that's where the arbitrage is, that's where, you know, um, people make money from gold smuggling. get off the plane and um, it's hot. It's right in the middle of the day and you're hit by this wall of heat and obviously we we're not really appropriately dressed. So we're kind of sweating. Uh, when you add to the fact that we're obviously quite nervous as well, we're, we're sweating quite a lot. But anyway, we go through, we queue up and, and well, passports are fine, we hand over the money. And then we go through these big double doors into the customs hall. And it is bustling and noisy. And there are four gates, which consist of a table and somebody searching people's luggage. And suddenly, Rhett stopped and looked puzzled. And I thought, what, you know, what's the problem here? He's not there. OK, he's not there. He's not there. The problem was he'd been told to go through gate four, but the usual guy uh, who manned gate four wasn't there. It was a woman in a purple sari. This has worked every single time. I've done it three, four times. It's been the same guy every single time. And it's not I blame you entirely. You fucking idiot. I didn't twist your fucking arm. They didn't take the gold across, all right? You wanted the money. Shut up. Don't talk about it. There was literally an awful, well, I don't know, three or four minutes. It dragged on forever, whereby... We were just sort of trying to look cool, but not moving, and therefore attracting more attention to ourselves whilst trying to have these conversations. Well, what are we going to do then? We can't just stand here. Brett, what's the fucking deal? What's the fucking deal? I don't know. It's not 
And eventually, we looked over to the woman in the purple sari, and she could see that we were struggling, and she just sort of... Four waves, what does that mean? Four waves, what does that mean? Do you know it? Of course I don't fucking know. I know one side. guy, I told you, you got a better idea? No, of course I've got a fucking better idea. It's not my idea. It's if you don't have a better idea, then why don't you shut the fuck up? Okay. Rep was first, he put his bag down. Thank you very much. Oz was next. I was last. I'd rather not have been last, but everything seemed to be going fine. Until suddenly, on the other side of the customs hall... Stop! There wasn't really a thought in my head at this point. I just sort of couldn't really take on board what was happening, but... There was this little guy with a moustache. He grabbed Eric. My worst fears are kind of being realised. He gets out a um, metal detector. And it goes off with a noise like a car alarm. to walk towards him. But, I, you know, I, I thought, well, what can I do? <laughs> he just pushed us both in the direction of this room to the side of the customs hall and just, like, ashen-faced, in total shock, we, we went into this room and there was... Uh, it was just bedlam from there. Whilst Eric and I are sitting in this room, Oz and Rhett have walked through and are on the other side, waiting for us to come through. You gotta check out the monkey temple while you're here, man. Yeah, right there. Do they have elephants or? No. <laughs> They're not in the city, man. <laughs> oh, Get the fuck off me! Whoa, 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 stop! But instead of us coming out, it was four or five armed policemen coming out. As they started opening it, you know. I was feeling pretty awful at the time. And then suddenly I thought, well, hang on. I hope that it's just gold we've got, I've got in my vest, you know, that there isn't a couple of packets of heroin as well. You know, I just thought, well, how stupid have I been? Quite remarkably stupid in retrospect. Thankfully, though, there was no sudden appearance of any packets of white powder. Whoa. Oh. We had never seen the gold before, obviously. We'd only felt how heavy it was. No, you stop it, stop it, gold, stop it, stop it, stop it. And we'd just seen sort of denim pockets and known that the gold was in it. So to actually see what we were eventually smuggling was quite a revelation.
And it was quite a revelation to the customs officials who were gathering around. We later discovered it was the, the largest seizure of gold ever in the history of gold smuggling in Nepal. So they were naturally rather amazed at the amount that we had had the audacity to try and smuggle into their country. Forms were produced which were written in Nepalese which they wanted signatures to. And we didn't know what they said. We didn't have any legal representation. We didn't have anything. But you know, with people shouting angrily in your face and thrusting a pen at you, you don't want to cause unnecessary trouble, but you don't want to sign your life away. In the end, we signed them because we didn't want us to be seen to be causing trouble. Then what happened, and this was the only time I must have come close to, uh, I suppose, um, emotionally, this was, this was a difficult, very difficult moment. I've never been in handcuffs before. Um, and they were big, rusty, very third world handcuffs. That was just a powerful, symbolic act of putting on handcuffs. That's when you truly lose your freedom. Four of us were put into a jeep, and I think there were four armed guards with us. We didn't know whether we were being sort of kidnapped or anything like that. And we were just driven off into the night. It was dark and we couldn't see the country that we'd landed in. We eventually pulled up outside this sort of wall. We were pushed through this hole in the wall, all four of us, and we were in prison. We realised we were in prison, uh, uh, and uh, it was sort of dark, and there were just rows of men sleeping all over the place. We thought that we were being put in a sort of holding place prior to being thrown out of the country the next day. That's what we clung on to. Strangely, I slept incredibly well. <laughs> I, I, it was an exhausting experience the whole day, and by the time we got there, I shut my eyes, and I did manage to sleep and woke up the next day, you know, surrounded by this hubbub of being in the middle of a prison. <laughs> I just could not believe I was there. I sort of woke up and thought, well, what's going on here? Uh, all oh, right, yeah, I was arrested last night for, for gold smuggling. I've been slung in prison. Here I am. There was a call from the front gate, and we had to get back into a jeep with some more soldiers in, and we were driven back to the airport. And we thought, excellent news, yes. Right. <laughs> an interesting little stay in prison. They've seized the gold, they're happy with that. We're obviously going to be putting the first flight out of here. Get out of here, you, you idiots. First flight home. But when we got to the airport, we were taken to a building on the airport grounds which had a sign outside saying, Customs Court. And it quickly transpired that Anyone caught smuggling at Nepalese, at the Nepalese airport was tried at the customs court. But then it turned out that the customs court was simply an office, a rather shabby, small office with a bit of paperwork in it, and that the judge 
was actually the chief of customs who was the bloke who'd arrested us the previous evening. And we thought, well, this is just crazy here. You know, I was expecting, if we were going to have to go to a court, I was expecting something that resembled a court, somebody that resembled a judge. We just didn't know what to do. We're just, like, alone on the other side of the world, being shouted at by the bloke who arrested you, who's also your judge. It's like, this is, this is not... This is not a planet or a legal system that I'm familiar with. From where you brought it? From where you brought it, this gold? There were some questions about did we know whose gold it was? We just take the gold, pick it up in Hong Kong. Take it to Kathmandu. We find out when we get here, we give it to. I think, satisfied that we didn't really know anything about anything, he pretty quickly said we'd all been sentenced to four years. Four years? In jail in Nepal? Yes. Not not deported? You have brought 112 kilos of gold. As per rule, the cost which includes the 112 kilo gold, the same amount you have to pay. Unless we could pay the value of the gold seized in a fine. Since we didn't have $1.6 million gold on us, that was looking rather unlikely. So, stunned, shocked, and, and still in a state of sort of uh, disbelief, we were taken back to the prison to begin our sentence. You know, just... unable to really... comprehend what, what had happened to us in the previous 48 hours. I wondered what had gone wrong. Why didn't this operation go smoothly like all the other ones had done? Who was the guy who, first of all, apprehended Eric and then myself? Why did that happen if everyone was paid off? We were later to find out that, you know, there were other things afoot. But for, for, at that time, we had not a clue. Life in prison in Kathmandu was very frightening. We didn't know whether there would be violence, whether there would be sexual violence. It was a prison that just had everything from murderers and child molesters and rapists, thieves, drug addicts. The whole range of criminality was there. On the first or second day, I was introduced to the only other white guy in prison. He looked simply quite extraordinary. He looked like a, some sort of wizard from, from another century. And he talked in riddles. He talked in total gibberish, basically. I discovered that he uh, had been a gold smuggler, had been in for nearly four years, and had gone mad. This was particularly frightening, because my greatest fear now was... I don't know, depression or being cut off from your friends and family. You know, I, you don't know where that's going to take you mentally. And it seemed to me that here was potentially the future of me. Just bonkers. I composed a very difficult letter to my mother um, saying, don't worry. I've ended up in prison. It's in Nepal. I didn't tell you I was going to Nepal, but I'm here. Uh, and, you know, I feel uh, stupid, selfish, pretty wretched, really, you know. All, all of the, the, the sort of bravado had drained away like dirty bath water and was left with a, a slightly scared young man wishing he could go back in time and, and, and reverse some decisions that have proved to be uh, less than sensible.
After three or four days in prison, we received an American visitor um, who asked to speak to Rhett. And his name was Ian, and he was somebody that Rhett had met on previous visits. So how's it going, man? How's it going? And I'm in Nepalese prison. Pretty fucking shit. Write you some stuff, though, for my friends in education. What you got? He worked for the Nepalese gangsters, and he brought with him food and bedding, and basically his message was, anything's possible in Nepal, we know who to speak to, we'll pay a couple of people off here or there, and, you know, money talks, and, and we'll get you out. There was an enormous sense of relief uh, and, and excitement and hope that, you know, we hadn't been forgotten about. We received regular visits from Ian every uh, week to 10 days with more money, with more food, whatever, you know. We were constantly being promised that our release was just around the corner. We just carried on waiting and hoping and eventually the weeks turned into months. Then one day after about three months, the planned day of the visit turned up and no one visited us. And um, that was it. No one visited us after that. One of our friends in the prison, a Nepalese guy, he was actually a silver smuggler. He explained to us the Nepalese uh, system. If you're in the jail, if you're in the jail, yeah. for two months, uh -huh. can't appeal. Can't can't, can't. can't appeal. Can't for three, if we stay for three more months, two, we can't appeal. Two months. So we've, done, we've got three more months to appeal after doing three months. No. If you didn't lodge an appeal against your sentence within the first three months, then you could no longer lodge your appeal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Two months. Yeah, three months. Yeah. Can't appeal. Can't appeal. Can't appeal. Three months. Can't appeal. Can't. And three months had gone by, and we'd been told by the Nepalese gangsters to keep quiet. And as soon as that three months was up, they dropped us. And so we were left with no chance now of getting out. It became very clear that we'd just been strung along from the beginning. And we had to think of other ways how we were going to get out without spending four years there. Uncle Tony actually wasn't an uncle. He was something like a second cousin, but he was always an uncle to me. I also knew that, you know, Uncle Tony had um, been in the RAF and uh, had a, quite a dis distinguished career there, and I knew that he'd afterwards had some sort of slightly more shadowy role, which made him a kind of James Bond in my eyes. He was a kind of like, a, you know, a bit of a hero figure for me. I received a call from the front gate, and there, waiting, was Tony, in a big green barber, the same one he used to wear on his farm. And it was a quite an emotional moment, because suddenly there was one of my family here to try and help get me and my friends out. Tony um, had done his research, and we knew that once a year, on the king's birthday, the king, in all his mercifulness, agrees to let out certain people on a pardon. Tony got us writing paper, and we composed a nice letter to his highness, saying, could you let us out on your birthday, please, your highness? We were guilty but we're sorry, and we'd like to go home. <laughs> Tony's role was really to act as our representative on the outside. You know, we just wanted Tony to meet as many people as possible. We didn't know how any one contact might be able to help us, but we understood that if you were going to get out via writing to the king, you had to have political support on the inside. And so Tony met up with an interesting guy 
called Lucas. Lucas, it transpired, was an American who worked with the Nepalese gangsters. In fact, he was closely involved in organizing the, um, the greasing of palms of the customs officials at the airports in Kathmandu. But he wasn't in the country at the time when we were arrested. He had been called away by the Nepalese gangsters to Hong Kong. So whilst we were heading for Nepal, Lucas, who would normally be overseeing the bribing of the customs officials, is arriving in Hong Kong. Lucas pretty soon realised that we had been set up. They invited him over to Hong Kong so that he didn't meddle in our arrest. Our arrest was planned from the start by the two guys that we had met in Chunking Mansions. They packed us to the gills with as much gold as possible and told hey, the chief of customs that we were going to be arriving. And the deal was, if you inform on any gold smugglers in Nepal, you get a quarter of the value of the gold seized. So the more you put on your gold smugglers and the more money you get, we end up spending four years and they end up extremely wealthy men. It felt pretty bad when we realised we were the victim of the setup, but it felt pretty good as well because um, suddenly our chances of getting out increased, uh, increased quite significantly. Lucas had contacts, or so he claimed, at you know pretty much every level of government, right up to the prime minister, and then beyond. He told Tony on that first meeting that he was very interested in helping us get out and he would do everything in his power to get us out, despite the guys who got us in. It was December the 17th, and I remember the cry of uh, English from the front gate. There was the English vice consul from the embassy. She said, uh, I don't know how or why, but I've come here to tell you that we've been informed this morning that you're going to be released on the King's birthday on December the 29th. And, uh, oh, I don't know, I mean, it's just an extraordinary, uh, extraordinary feeling. I then had the uh, rather pleasant task of going back inside the prison gathering Oz, uh, Eric and, and Rhett around and, uh, telling them that we were getting out. We'd been very stupid in getting in and we'd been very lucky in getting out, but we were incredibly relieved that it looked like our ordeal was uh, coming to an end. I went in search of adventure, but the plan for um, proving oneself had gone about as dramatically wrong as it could have gone. I still dream. I have regular dreams where I've tried to smuggle again, and I've failed again, and I'm back in prison, and I'm counting the days again. And uh, it's never a particularly nice dream. I wouldn't want to experience the thrill of smuggling or attempting to smuggle ever again. And the series concludes next week here on 5 at the same time, 9 o'clock.